Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Vox Vomitus. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the novels Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, Pretty Ugly, and the Hotel series. Joining me today, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, Alison Martine, author of the bourbon books, which includes dibs since September, move on Melinda and climb the salmon ladder. She's wearing a beret today because she is very artsy, very French. No French. Very French. Not and French. This is going to actually make sense when we tell you that our guest today is Laura Morelli, Hello. author of The Stolen Lady. Among many other books, but The Stolen Lady is a novel about the Mona Lisa set in World War II and before. It is about Da Vinci. Jen is modeling her Da Vinci coat. Um, I know, for those of you who are not watching this. Yeah, and I, and I said coat, by the way. She, this is not the Da Vinci code. Wrong episode. Okay, go on. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the book that we are talking about today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm Laura Morelli. And the first thing I have to say is that you really nailed the coat because the coat. Um, we have some primary sources about Leonardo da Vinci of people who knew him at the time who said that he uh, loved to wear purple. And we know from his uh, inventories of his traveling cases that he had lavender hose to match his tunic. And, and so you are absolutely perfectly attired. For this I'm perfectly attired for Leonardo da Vinci. I was like, should I go like World War II fun or just like <laughs> full blown Renaissance artist. Well, well Alison and, has on the beautiful blue beret. Yes. I stole it from my nine-year-old. Yeah, don't tell her. <laughs> I know, Allison's like, yeah. I'm wearing a beret. I'm like, I guess I'm going to go you know, full Da Vinci. Yeah, I don't have the costume background that Jennifer does. So I, I do what can I find on my children's floor? And I put it on. That's what it's I do. Perfect. It's yeah. perfect. So the, the book is The Stolen Lady. It's a dual timeline historical novel. It goes back and forth between Florence, Italy around the turn of the 16th century and then to World War II France. And the entire story hinges around the famous painting, the Mona Lisa. And it's based on not just one true story, but actually many true stories um, that happened to this incredible painting. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is so interesting about art history, and I've trained as an art historian, is that works of art have can have many lives long after the artist is gone they continue to live on and they can go on incredible adventures and the mona lisa has probably had the most <laughs> storied history of just about any work of art in in the history of art and so i think it was uh it was just a fascinating story to research it was a bit overwhelming because of just the ask, amount of like, research how <laughs> much in there were you scared going into this? And did you, I mean, you're an art historian, so you knew what you were getting into. But when, just when I saw like the blurb of this book, I thought that is terrifying to research. <laughs> I love it so much. Thank God I didn't write it. Let's get her on the show. <laughs> she did the work for us. Well, Yay. Yeah. It was an interesting question because the book started out with a kind of a small ish question or two kind of smallish questions and then it ballooned into this massive project and what was interesting about the timing of it was this was my pandemic book so I was gonna ask world, I saw that I would, have been, yeah. <laughs> I would have been traveling and I would have been sitting in archives and in Italy and France and but um, I was sitting in my lawn chair in the backyard with my laptop. Right. I mean, now. that's okay. just as good. It's just as oh, good as being in the Louvre. <laughs> you know, it's it's really of all the books, the historical novels that I've written, this one is probably the most sweeping in its scope. It takes us from, uh, you know, from Tuscany to Lombardy and to across yes. the Alps to all of these French chateaux in the Loire Valley. So it is kind of a vicarious travel experience and it was perfect um really in <laughs> retrospect as a covid book because i was traveling you also did touch on some year. plague issues you know right in the book. 
you know, exactly. as you do. <laughs> like, and you even start, you said sweeping in scope, but you sw- you're sweeping in timeline too, because when we start, I'm like, oh, I wonder who this woman is. Oh, hey, that baby, that baby is the Mona Lisa. Like, I didn't know who was that her. baby. <laughs> Mona Lisa. This is earlier than I thought we'd pick up that thread, but go for it. I, yeah. I screamed so loud the first time that you said like, oh, you are charged with taking care of baby Lisa. And I was like, yes, I know where that's happening. <laughs> um, and my poor dog was just like, can you please stop screaming, mommy? You know? uh, it's great. Well, I, you know, it started, this story started for me because I, I visited Paris. I was very fortunate to visit Paris when I was 12 years old. And, and I uh, went back to read my diary, my 12 year old. I wanted to see what 12 year old Laura um, had to say about, yes, about seeing the Mona Lisa. And of course, um, I yet, want you to read from the, that right now. This is in the dark ages, right? Oh, so you, it was you could go into the Louvre. Yes, you could go into the Louvre and just walk right up to it. There weren't 10 million people standing in front of it. Oh. And so I, you know, for years I kept reading about and of course hearing about the Mona Lisa smile, the famous smile. But when I went back to read my diary, what I had, what I wrote was that Yes, I had seen the Mona Lisa smiling, but there was something that seemed a bit sad to me. Um, and I, that idea of the melancholy Lisa kept sort of coming back to me every time I would see a picture of the painting. And I wondered about that kind of dichotomy of, you know, the smile that doesn't quite reach the eyes, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later, well, you describe was- it as reaching the corner of her eyes. And I loved that so much. Yeah. Because I was just like, well, there it is. Because it doesn't reach her <laughs> eyes. Mm-hmm. She's not happy, but it, she's not necessarily unhappy. <laughs> right. <laughs> there's like there's like a moment of, can I feel something? Like, right. that's always when I look at the Mona Lisa painting, I say, she's on the precipice of feeling something. That's very interesting. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, later I learned that this painting was never delivered to its patron. So I had no idea about that either. When that, I read that, that early, really, and I'm like, well, what the heck happened? And then we're at exactly, a couple of while. Yeah. I'm like, please tell me that is something you made up. It was in a bathroom. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> oh, among so bathroom. many other crazy places. I mean, this painting has been some in some it's been, you know, under people's beds and in an armoire. And it's been in all of these crazy places. But when I discovered that the painting was never delivered to Francesco del Giacondo or Lisa, um, and nobody knows why, I thought, oh, this is perfect. It's perfect for the that historical gives me novelist. Chills. So it, it sort of took me down the, that path. And then, you know, once I realized I was in a project where I was, you know, researching Leonardo da Vinci and the Italian Renaissance and Florence in 1500 and World War II and the Nazis and, you know, the Louvre, the history Too small of the Louvre, time it's just like there. a right. really a lighthearted song. piece that We're is easy to write. A huge, you know, huge research project, but it was really thrilling and exciting and like I said it took me away from from my little world during uh, the pandemic year so it was actually in retrospect a great project to be working on so like I love this so much I love historical fiction before we went live I said like oh I was an art history major for like a hot minute and really it was literally (laughs) like one year hey that's at least a complete course or seven maybe it was yeah it was it was a a lot of great courses and I was lucky my college um where we did our art history classes was in the basement of a museum so Mm -hmm. instead of like looking at slides we would before the museum opened we walked around and talked about paintings how fantastic it was really good but this is also what got me into trouble later in life because like I never touch the paintings. I know I'm not allowed to, but I got like real close <laughs> in many museums where I'm like, look at that. And I've been kicked out of two museums for almost touching paintings. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay. I have never been kicked out of a museum. In and, my and defense, I wasn't going to touch them. But they didn't know that. And if they looked at your face, they probably couldn't tell. 
I know they didn't because I was like, oh. <gasps> it was right there. <laughs> It was, it was like, well, yeah, and it was like, I only got to take one art history court. That was not what I was there for. And the one I took was way too early because mine was history pursuit of the millennium. And it was across history and art class. And it was oh, all wow. leading up to the thousand because I took this in the year 1999, just before we had the next millennium and talking about how, hey, everybody th thought the world was going to end. So we didn't get as far as any of the Ninja Turtles. So you get three of them in the book, <laughs> which as a child of the 80s and 90s, I was really happy to see. Um, I did not see Donna tello in there he was my favorite i'm kind of sad about that not because he's my favorite artist this is like ninja turtles talking but you covered okay. you covered the rivalry <laughs> at least a one-sided rivalry including michelangelo i love that so behind much his, behind his little oh what is he doing sculpting in a box how pretentious right. is that? Like, I love that. <laughs> sculpting that's just like stonework Ugh. Yeah, really? and I have a I have a whole book about it. I don't know if you've seen my book, The Giant, that's which the giant. is the story like... of, of Michelangelo's David, which is another story that's so crazy you can't make it up. So, no. <laughs> but I did my best. No, I haven't it's gotten to read that one yet. Does it have like the opposing viewpoint? Would you read them together, like parallax novels, or like you, this you one's could. this, this one's the other one, and they can have their little off-page war, really war of the of the greats. You could, yes. I mean, you know, all of my historical novels are, can be read, you know, alone, they're standalones, but I do sort of sprinkle in these little um, breadcrumbs across all of them. So if you read one and then pick up another one, you're going to see, you know, a character you recognize or a, a, some sort of topic or a place that you recognize. And there are some breadcrumbs that sort of lead from one to the do other. Do you love I Italy? Do oh, sorry. I have like it's such a stupid question, but it's, I feel like it's important. I'm just talking about uh, Ninja Turtles. Go ahead. Uh, do you love <laughs> Italy or France more? <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. I mean, Wait, I, whoever you say no to is not letting you back on their borders. So think. I you. know, exactly. I have to be diplomatic here, but. We can I've talk about it in a way of food and or art. <laughs> Well, I've lived in both countries and I studied romance languages and literature in college. Um, and so I, I studied French, Italian and Spanish and um, have lived in Spain as well. And so I, I love both of them. But I it's always oh, Italy, they're right? Quite different. <laughs> they're quite different. My but heart I mean, is, in, is in Italy for sure. I mean, if you know, if, if you really. For the pizza you know, alone. <laughs> among other things. But well, every time you say breadcrumbs, I, I'm going, are we talking French bread or is this bread we get in right. Italy? I don't know. Where's my so bread? I, I was telling you before we started, I brought three beverages. So yes. I'll tell you. Okay. So I, had to, I had to be diplomatic was... here too, because yes. I, I poured a, this is a Chemin Blanc from the Loire Valley. So part that of the story. That is clear. Takes place in the Loire Here's Valley. Like, for a second, I was saying, and, I'm drinking fancy water. Like it's Perrier. I'm like, that's not that fancy, Laura. Go ahead. <laughs> And this is Chianti Classico, of course, from Tuscany. But that one. Lisa Garadini, mm. who we believe is Simona Lisa, actually had a country home in the Chianti region and had um, vines there. So this, yes. this one is in honor of Lisa. Oh, my and speaking gosh. Speaking of very fancy water, this is um, filtered North Carolina water in a mason jar. So Love it. That's this the fanciest of your yourself. drinks. <laughs> So these are my my beverages that I have here I in case uh, in <laughs> case you get parched you get panicked. Parched. I just, parched I'm or laughing panicked. Going, why do you have the water? And I'm going, oh, in case you actually want something to drink and you're not just yeah. drinking. That's, <laughs> that's a little different there. Well, and I, I loved when you were talking about all the stuff that's happening in the different points, including some of the stuff with the World War II. And I already have shamed myself by mentioning the, the Ninja Turtles. But when we get to the part where we've got the French <laughs> resistance and we've got the Maquis, my first thought is, that was in Voyager. <laughs> Oh, really? What, what, is, what, is what the Maquis was. Star Trek Voyager. The Maquis oh. are the resistance fighters, and they take their name from the resistance fighters oh, in France. Right. And there's yeah. even episodes that deal with them in oh, that. Go I feel that like now. as somebody who wore a Star Trek communicator to her prom, I feel really bad that I didn't understand <laughs> that. Don't know that. That's why, but it, it just shows like the gaps in my education because I have a history minor, I think, I don't know, but it was American history. And I've only had a little bit of European history, enough to only know that the French just keep vacillating between 
dictatorship and democracy and they've been on democracy for a while now so we're a little worried like uh uh-uh, what are you guys gonna do but What's that's next? really all yeah. i know i don't i don't have the background and i'm reading all these names i wish they would have given us books like yours to let us learn history that way because it becomes so much more lively when we go <laughs> oh i know who machiavelli is oh, right. oh yeah, i know who savonarola is oh he dead now okay uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of that going on and you just casually sprinkle in that in so many ways and i do not mean this in a in a condescending way, this is like the Forrest Gump of both eras because you have these really important people and here you've got this kind of nobody, Belina, who is this, she's she's really nobody and I'm assuming she's either a She's me. Not a, she's you, she's not you. She's me. What was the source for her? Because as for people who haven't gotten to read the book yet, she is the one who is charged with caring for young Lisa. She is basically a peasant woman who is in the house of Lisa's family. And then when Lisa marries, she goes with Lisa there, but she's perfectly placed to be part of the, I'm going to say Frateshi. How do you say that? Frateshi, the the brotherhood who's like down with greed and wealth and the sin of gluttony and all of that and Savonarola's people. And then she's still there when the Medici's are coming in. And I remember all these names, but my brain just has like that spark of recognition and that's it. And then I go, (laughs) I should have remembered more of this. (laughs) Well, you know, that's what I think is so great about historical fiction. And, you know, I think that's why historical fiction readers come to the genre. It's certainly why I come to the genre, too, is, you know, the we don't want to necessarily get hit over the head with a history book, but we want to absorb the the history, but in a way where you feel like you're walking the streets, smelling the smells, seeing the sights where drinking the wine. Drinking, drinking the wine, the wine, eating the food, eating and, the know, food, make, making the it cheese. sort of comes to life. Exactly. So mixing the that's paints. The, that's what's Make so sure the paints didn't go rancid. Get your gesso. <laughs> No, gesso? You, gesso. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce gesso. that. It's gesso. gesso. It's, it's a G and, that's pronounced J. I've been calling it gesso for years, and people are like, what do you want? <laughs> you want you're guessing you want that? Oh, gesso. Okay. Not so you all. asked about Belina. She is really, I think, one of my favorite characters I've ever worked on. And I love a servant character in a book because, you know, particularly in a culture like Renaissance Italy, where things were very stratified socially, you know, a servant character is a, can be a bit invisible. And so they can go into Mona Lisa's bedroom. They can go <laughs> into Leonardo da Vinci's studio. They can go to the fish They market can hold the Mona the Lisa wash. painting they, uh-huh. in their hand. They can yeah. get it out of and have it. bad situations. Right. I'll just, I don't want to spoil And yeah. so they can bad sort situation. of maneuver into all of these different places and, and be exactly where you want them to be at the right time. <laughs> Uh, for a story. So, and, you know, the part about um, the, the, all the tumult around the Medici and the, and the rise of Savonarola and then his burning in the square, that was such an incredibly um, tumultuous time in Florentine history. And I've always wanted to write a character who threw something onto the bonfire of the vanities at the end of the 15th century. And and so Belina, you know, this poor gullible servant woman who was so brainwashed, you know, (laughs) I just thought, oh, this is a perfect, you know, person to, to do this. And then to sort of have to live with the aftermath of that and of those decisions, you know, someone who got sort of caught up in the popular frenzy of the time and then had to make those decisions. You gave Belina such an amazing backstory and history. So I know you just like refer to her as like gullible and yes, she was, but like you feel for her. Like I never felt like she was, I don't, I don't even know how to say it. She came out of this entire story a much richer person yes and i didn't even feel that she was gullible as much as i felt like she was a product of her times and her upbringing she's us like, she's yeah, everybody she, she's absolutely the every woman but who has that perspective like you said she's a servant so she's got the particular advantage of being in the wealthy home but herself not being right. wealthy and seeing the gilded cage she lives in and going well but what else is there for me and it was interesting because it's just kind of a lifestyle i hadn't even really considered because we know the concept of an indentured servant or a slave but the idea 
idea of someone who's basically just given to a household and it's like, is she paid wages, but she just lives there. Does she have freedom to go somewhere else? And as it goes on and she is still just following. And her role is kind of an honor too, because she was like, you are caring for my most beloved baby. She's there at the baptism. So is she essentially a godmother? Is that the role that she was given? Because that word was never used. And I don't know if that's an American term and not like a traditional term that would have been used at the time, but she is charged before God with, you know, sprinkle the baby. That baby's yours right. now. Like, oh. Well, you know, She's like I 15. Think was, going, really? in, <laughs> in these upper class families of, you know, of the Italian Renaissance, the, the lady of the house would have had sort of a retinue of mm-hmm. women around her, you know, that were, it was sort of a hierarchy, you know, she might have her, you know, mother-in-law bless her and you know she would have her you know her her servants and her confidants mm. and so Belina is sort of a servant but but you're right her her role is a bit of an honor because she's been her her parents were with the family for many for with uh, Lisa's family for years and so it's kind of an honor for her to be you know per, to pull Lisa under her wing and she's seen her grown up She's never known anything different. And so, like you said, she's kind of an every person because she's just a product of her time. Um, so that for me was a really fun character to uh, well, I, to think about. She's great. Well, and I love all the great. things she, she, she is great. And I love all the things you keep sticking in her pockets. <laughs> Look, it keeps changing. Oh my gosh. pockets today. Tassels, <laughs> maybe it something phone? she's stolen. <laughs> um, love it. I feel like there could be a weird choose your own adventure series with like what is in Belina's pockets. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. And then, then she then chooses it. something. But then you even reference some of that. Some of those are the Easter eggs later that it's not explicitly said like, Oh, this amulet could have like, Oh, I know what amulet that is, but it's never specifically right. said, Oh wait, it belongs to it. Because of course no one would necessarily know the provenance of said amulet, but it's, it was still right. lovely doing all that to see how it moves forward. And then in, in the present time, and it's so weird. You have a dual timeline and neither one of them is the present. That hurts my head because I'm going, wait a second. Both <laughs> I wanted to, over. I almost took out my whiteboard of like the, <laughs> the work that I'm doing for my own damn book. And like charted this out because that I was just helpful. like, I mean, it would have been helpful for nobody, but for you, <laughs> for me, emotionally, yeah. it would have been very helpful to, to wipe out the, my uh, the dates and the, uh, the yeah, it, and also like so. I really love parallels in books, yes. so I am not going to say specific phrases, no. But there were a couple specific phrases that were repeated. Uh, that I felt in the core of my being. Well, and there were ones that I loved because uh, of like, parallelism. Uh, <laughs> while Jennifer's having a fit, it's fine. Um, yeah. I'm having a fit. Uh, the, the People who are not watching it live, I'm having a fit. You can't, you can't <laughs> see her face, but if she's just, she's very clump for words. But the parallelism between there, how you would finish out one chapter in one timeline and start the next chapter in the other timeline, like the exact same phrase meaning something totally different, but still interconnected. I loved that, and I don't know if that was a technique you've used in your other books or if that was something specific for this. I don't know how many of them are dual timeline is this is this the only one that's dual timeline or is so this this is another this is the book that came out mm-hmm. before the stolen lady this is the night portrait that and it's also a dual timeline What's Here, it? This, yeah there you go now look at you a blue beret Perfect. that would be backwards <laughs> <laughs> look on your cover exactly yes. okay that's so enough. this is also a dual <laughs> timeline and a lot of readers picked up exactly what you just said that that um you know the renaissance timeline ends and the 1940s timeline begins and the the phrase the last uh sentence of one chapter is also the first sentence of the next chapter and i love it so um, much and that was fun (laughs) that was a way for me to try to link together these very different cultures and times and you know to have it be less jarring for the reader to go from Milan in the 1400s to, you know, Poland in 1939. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a different vibe. 
Completely. Like you said, it was never jarring then because it just effortlessly, like I, there were times when I was reading this and I'm like, okay, I need to stop at the next chapter because I need to go do X, Y, or Z. And then I didn't because you just kept, I'm like, oh, well, you pulled me in. So I ended up reading more chapters than I planned to. And I also, it is a longer book than a lot of the books we have on the show. And I thought I'm not going to get finished, but then you have so but many acknowledgements. I did because there's so many acknowledgements in here that I'm sure are going through all your research and you're like, show your work. And Laura's like, here's my work. Here's my PhD. <laughs> this is not stuff I just pulled out. of. See, I don't have a PhD in none of my work. No, I mean, look here, I went to school for theater. Mm -hmm. And like yes. I said, hot minute mm -hmm. art history major. Art history. Not nearly. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really what's great sad. about a novel. You know, when I was teaching in the college classroom, my students would sometimes ask me things that I didn't know the answer to. And I would say, well, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'd be happy to make something up. And then eventually <laughs> I, I figured out that making stuff up was awesome. <laughs> that's <laughs> so, your career. That was <laughs> it. I said, the oh, thing is, though, you can't did put you on a know test. that the Mona Lisa, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but, but Laura, you can't put it on a test. What was that thing I made up that one time and then have them write an essay right. about it? Because then they go to research it. You're like, Dr. Morelli is full of nonsense. I made that up. Up. <laughs> just that out of thing. Air. It could still be on a test if she the only one grading it yes you did listen to <laughs> my fictional story about the Mona Lisa um I did want to ask you because I know you're an art historian do you have a favorite painting oh gosh this is going to get her kicked out of all of the museums now yeah I, no, it, it I, can be, I don't um do you have a couple favorite paintings yeah, I don't think I have one. Um, the night it's really portrait hard. is about Leonardo da Vinci's lady with the ermine, which <gasps> Love is that. an incredibly Sorry. beautiful painting for a portrait. Um, Love that one. Uh, right now, I'm very deep into a book that has Botticelli's Primavera in it. And um, oh that's a God. very beautiful and incredibly complex painting. Um, but that one also, I think, is a favorite for a lot of people, as well as the birth of Venus, which was probably made around the same time and probably for the same patron. Those are just incredibly beautiful paintings that I think a lot of people are drawn to. Um, you imagine those like, are, hundreds, like thousands of years from now, two paintings that you commissioned end up in a museum. You're like, I have that good taste. <laughs> Can you imagine like the same patron? Yes, those are all me. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very much. I chose that. <laughs> this is what I wanted to be painted. Right. Really great. Well, and it's and it's funny though, because so the title of this book is The Stolen Lady. And we're dealing with in the World War II times when people are like, What what are you guys doing in World War II with the Mona Lisa? Everything had to be cleared out of the Louvre, or a lot of it did. Not everything could be moved because the Germans are like, Hey, we're either gonna bomb it or just take it. And the Nazi officers are just like, Oh, I like this one, and they're shopping and stuff. So those are not the kind of patrons any of us want. Nobody wants like the Nazi patrons. But I, I don't I'm assuming you were aware of some of the Mona Lisa's more recent pop culture influences and where she has shown up that she does not belong and uh i don't think i know about anything pop culture wise i know you do because you've seen the same movie I did. <laughs> okay never mind <laughs> we, we are making a little bit of a, of a glass onion reference and uh if anybody hasn't like seen what that, um, oh never mind no actual portraits were in, actually involved in that. So I'm just like, when I'm reading this, when you're talking about how these books can be read in any order and they're breadcrumbs, there's certain things that we go, spoiler alert, the Titanic sinks. The Mona Lisa does get painted. So like when he's going, oh, I'm not going to, there's there's a lot. I'm going never going to finish her. He's, he's not going to he's not going to get paid. So he's like, maybe I'm not going to do it. And there's this back and forth. And it's like, it's the Mona Lisa. And we're sitting here in the 21st century going, well, yeah, it's the Mona Lisa, so of course it gets painted, but the tension is still real, which is so kind of crazy because they're like, but does he paint well, it? Well, I, I really <laughs> think it was real. I mean, I, I'm 100% yes. convinced it was real. I mean, this was the kind of portrait that Leonardo da Vinci would have taken on as a project just to buy some Chianti Classico, right? I mean, I mean and a very not, fancy put coat. me up in it. He was, well, yeah. he was that, very focused on, I need that big patron. I need, you know, the King of France. I need the Duke of Ferrara to give me and, a and giant I'm building engineering project exactly, to move the Arno. You know, yes. and he was very focused on these massive engineering projects and things. So 
a portrait of a Florentine, you know, wife of a merchant, merchant. All right. was kind of like, well, okay, I got nothing else going on right now. I'll take that on if, you know, my father talked me into exactly. it. Or, you know, well, and, and then and, there was the whole business with, well, is there, are they going to put me up? Are they going to be feeding me? Oh, they're not? Oh, right. well, then what I'm kind of rooms either. am I going to be in? What's the wine like? Right. <laughs> Just all those considerations. <laughs> if I mean, these are things I think we should all theater, be thinking about. Just, just saying. We don't have the same kind of condition. <laughs> I know they have, like, buy me a cup of coffee or, or like, the, the Patreon or whatever, but we don't have wealthy people putting authors and artists up in their homes and feeding them. And I'm just saying. Not I'm, in America, no. unfortunately, no. <laughs> And, but I, but I but, think these, you know, I mean, these let's things throw that out the to real, the universe. real part. Yes, let's do. <laughs> if anybody wants to put us up in their Italian villa and feed Absolutely. us, yeah. we'll. I think we've. You've got three authors <laughs> here. We'll just write whatever. Yeah, we'll be. I was gonna say, sad Laura, Leonardo going. Mm, I'm not. This is not from my heart, but I'm gonna. Laura do it. has a reason to be there. Jen, you've you've written when you wrote Pretty Ugly. You you have things that are going on in Europe. I haven't. I have no legit reason to go anywhere. So I'm gonna have to work. On no, you it. have to. I'm like you have to. You have like to come my up book, with Pretty Ugly, wouldn't exactly. exist if I didn't literally miss every train going through northern Italy. It wouldn't exist. <laughs> yeah, I gotta miss more trains. That's all I'm saying. Just like go there and like figure it out. <laughs> just get lost. I mean, just what get I would lost. Do. It's really it's terrifying sometimes. Well and some of the terrifying things, even again knowing that the Mona Lisa is fine. The Mona Lisa not, is just did not take it, but watching Anne, because Anne is our main character in the World War II time period, going through all these logistical things and moving things to one place where they're gonna be safe, and then oh, they're not gonna be safe, partially because everything's moldy and there's mites in it. And I'm like Oh, the idea of bugs on the paintings freaked me out a lot. I am not good with bugs. I feel like I will say I've never been more scared of mold in my life. And mold is one of my biggest fears. <laughs> so this worked not as just historical fiction and art history, but it was a little bit horror for me because I was like, what if mold happens? Mold and mites. Yes, what if mold and mites happens? For and I was like, shaking. <laughs> It's a problem. No, we'd, we'd rather we'd rather not have any of those things go anywhere near our paintings. But some of the the terror, even of like, hey, we're getting out of this area. Oh no, we're we're being pursued, and now we're we're on bald tires. The idea of driving through mountains on tires that mm. aren't uh, with, with or without big trucks behind me, I'm just going. This is not going to end well. This is not. Gonna, and I knew it had to be okay <laughs> because, again, spoiler alert. Because the Mona, the Mona Lisa, Lisa is still exists. <laughs> but I was. Yeah, it but... is. It is crazy though, really, to think that you know the the staff of the Louvre packed up more than three thousand works I of love art, it moved so much. everything out, yep. and it all came back. I mean, that's the you know. I think that often we read about or hear about works of art that are still missing, and they are for sure. But I think it's almost more incredible that how many things actually came back on the back. Cave. And, and the fact that the there was German officer. there was really yeah. like a thing where like everybody was like, we are going to protect these works of art, mm -hmm. whatever we have to do. And I, I've always loved that. So this is why I loved your book so much. Um, the idea of quote unquote normal people mm -hmm. taking the best works of art and just moving them completely over and over and over just so the beauty of it can exist yeah they did it for i love us. it so much they, they, they did, did it, it for, for us. us and that's that's incredible and it happens you know all over europe all over the world it's happening right now in ukraine the, mm -hmm. the museums are packing their their works of art moving them into basements, moving them away from the cities. Um, you know, unfortunately, history is repeating itself in that way right now. Um, so yeah. it's uh, it happened in World War I. Um, I think after World War I, people, so a lot of the museum staff kind of learned what could happen, but certainly they didn't have any idea of scale of, yeah. of the uh, World War II. Yeah looting. But, um, you know, the Louvre evacuation so was many the largest. Years museum evacuation in history so it's it's it was just amazing to me that it all came back well and uh, it was interesting museum. 
you'd even brought up the idea of okay as as alliances shift who who is claiming it's like okay all of a sudden someone who is and again i don't want to spoil but a character who was participating in this okay now italy's not on the same side by the way we're going, oh. we're going to lose our <laughs> italians and 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 oh by the way the italians <laughs> want their their painting back and i had no idea and again i i feel like my AP Euro history teacher is going to come back and retroactively remove the A she gave me because I clearly wasn't paying enough attention. But I had no idea that. So, so the Mona Lisa was gifted to the French people. So it was never technically in it, even though everybody involved was Italian, it was never te technically belonging to the Italian people. And then the whole idea of like, well, who decides where the art goes and or where it belongs? And so many things like, uh, so some of these things we may have gotten through colonialism, we probably should give back less so with art and more so with things that we've just stolen across different conquests. And it's like, well, where is this supposed to go? And then when wars happen, and then you've got to put things back, it's like, Okay, well, where is where is back? What is proper place? And when you've got something, we've got papers of provenance. We got. But here's the thing: like, what does who does art belong to? What does art belong to? It's so all of that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as an artist, I always just think I want the work to be for humans. Mm -hmm. One, two, five countries, it doesn't matter. But at that time, it really did. And Lori, you did such a great job with this. It's just. Thank you. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's Leonardo da Vinci himself brought the Mona Lisa to France. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what boggled my mind was to think about this man, you know, in his mid 60s, he would have been gray haired with a long gray beard you know at 65 Hands? he would have been considered elderly you know and he would have br probably ridden on mule back over the alps um, he was carrying the mona lisa and several <sighs> other works of art with him um, and he ended up with the king of france as his patron which was one of his big dreams through um, you know, his adulthood but he never went back to Italy and those works of art stayed in the French Royal collection. And then the French Royal collection became the, the seed of the Louvre. And so, um, yes, I mean, it, he brought it himself to France. There's no, you know, better provenance than that. So, so he brought it there cool. with his yes. fingers. <laughs> I put it there. It stays there. It's there. Oh, it. It's like right. what I say to my kids. <laughs> Leave it where you found it, dude. But you know, the Mona Lisa was famously stolen from the Louvre in 1911 by an Italian man <laughs> who well. said that he, his rationale was that he wanted it, you know, it belonged to Italy, that it was going back to Italy. But I don't think he realized the story about yeah, like, oh, going no, over the Alps. It doesn't belong to Italy. <laughs> well, and you mentioned that in your book. Isn't it just like under his coat, like he's the worst art thief ever? <laughs> doing dude that's yeah. how you like watch a good heist film then try it i mean i love i love art heist things thing like uh, i think because i live a little bit north of boston and a little bit north of the isabella stewart gardner museum and there was like a huge art heist there so like i grew up with the idea your art can be stolen Yes, and in, in some of the craziest like, ways, what? too. I mean, the, the Gardner heist was such a... I was living in Boston at the time. That that Shut happened. up! And, Sorry. And no, Me I remember it well, Jennifer. and it was so scary and strange. I mean, just how that happened. So, yeah, the Wait, stories have written, are Laura, have are you written amazing. a book about any art heists? Because the stolen lady is ne not technically stolen. That's <laughs> right. Still yeah, like, she's she was some, hidden a lot. Just, like, yeah, I have the some lady, things I've worked on thinking about, but, but oh, I haven't it, written a strict art heist book yet. <laughs> I mean, can you please for me, <laughs> for <laughs> Allison, <laughs> like, like art I mean, that's why like, I just like do it. something. It wasn't, it wasn't just for Christian Kane. It was mostly for Christian Kane. Sorry, oh, but again, I love those art heists, and I I love. <laughs> Yeah, of that and so when when i started reading stolen lady that's what i'm saying like oh is this about oh no it's not we're just moving around she's good she's good but again 
The Lady Gets Around is not a good title. So we're not going with that one. We're going yeah, with- Lady Gets Around has a very different meaning different than the Stolen meaning. Lady. Eh. Might get you a different audience than you Poor were Poor Laura. It's like, Absolutely. why did I do this show? <laughs> no, she knew what she was getting into. She has two glasses of wine. That's right. Yes. No. <laughs> I'm ready. She's, I'm prepared. She is not an innocent. I mean, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm looking at my eyebrows. And one of the things that horrified me in your book, and I know we are getting to the point where you said, but okay, I did eyebrows. not know people back then were plucking out their eyebrows and eyelashes. And I mean, yeah, I need to do something with mine, but plucking them completely go- Why was that? That was quite a fashion statement. Why? I know. I know. So, like, can it's the opposite can, of putting on the eyebrows with the yeah, sharpie that's no. so popular. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I so here's the better. thing. Like, I did my eyebrows today. It's not a sharpie, but it was just like <laughs> still makeup. Uh, but the idea of plucking my eyelashes out, ah, mm. literally, figuratively, every way sends me into the worst panic attack I think I've ever had. <laughs> Okay, when I but was I want to talk about it. <laughs> my my cousin, I really hope he is not watching this, sat in the back of my mom's car with yellow sunglasses with the lens <laughs> pulled out, and he was sitting there plucking his eyelashes. And now my mother was a blonde and had like barely any eyelashes unless she put them on with Mary, you know, Mary Kay and all that stuff. And he's just pulling out these gorgeous eyelashes, and my mother's like, What are you doing? She was just jealous, I think. But maybe he was trying I'm, to I'm jealous now. Fashion. That is crazy. Yeah, yeah I, it, I mean, it was a fashion statement, you know, the, to uh, to have. So the... did uh, I? Don't think I want to know, but I kind of want to know. Like they <laughs> anyway. plucked them out themselves, or like their servant people did, or they. Yeah, they, they had all the eyelashes. Of, um, you know, there's some historians. Oh, who have some research I hate about it. All the cosmetic concoctions, you know, yeah, that you could like buy that with body, body hair. Feet. Yep, all I the mean, filatories and I get you know, that. they used like horse Not urine having, to bleach the hair uh, and um, you know, snails shells crushed up for the skin. It was supposed to like make your skin bleached and um, okay, all I haven't of used it, but things. somebody gave me like a <laughs> Korean snails something face mask. I haven't opened it. Okay. I'm a little scared of it, but it's supposed to have like Snails. I don't eat snails. That's one of the things I won't eat. And I don't want to put on my face either. I try not to step on them when I go outside in the rain and they all show up. I don't I don't think that we should be putting them on our face. No. <laughs> don't give it to Jennifer. I think she's hyperventilating. I know. I'm like, oh, I'm going to die. <laughs> Over the um, eyebrows and the snails. As like, I'm just like, I can't do it. Also, I'm a super vegetarian. Yeah, this, like, is, this is not working. Well, and it's funny because one of the most simplistic. And breathe in, breathe out. It's one of the it's one of the ones that you have when Leonardo is traveling and he's got like I want to say it was pecorino and some some like preserved figs and some bread and some dried venison and I'm going I want that picnic I don't want the venison I'll, I'll skip that but the bread the figs and the cheese that's like the sample aisle at Trader Joe's and I want that I like, would that eat so good. bread fig and cheese right <laughs> now Trader Joe's I'm, I'm working on a story right now where one that's of the called bread fig and a, cheese is a cook. <laughs> <gasps> yep, and I love the, the just the reading about the historical food. It's so Yum. interesting. Oh if my you need any beta so readers <laughs> for that one, Laura, just, just call me because I, I do love art, but I am I do not know nearly enough about it to call myself like an art Allison's lover. That we really know. into but eating a, weird food. I'm just not oh, weird. really. I'm not into eating weird food. I'm eat, into eating good food, and because Jen does not eat meat half of what I eat, she's like, Mm-mm. and I eat. Pretty much anything. I don't eat snails, and I thanks to Josh Mallerman, I won't eat pig anymore because Pearl freaked me out. But beyond that, yeah, Josh ruined me. But beyond that, like I love food in fiction because I find it such a big part of life. And so yeah. many books seem to just act like their characters never eat, and it's not equivalent. Right. Like, well, they don't have to watch them flush in the toilet either. It's not the same. There's so much joy and connection in eating that I am incapable of writing books without putting a lot of food in it. And I've had like people say, do not read her books while fasting because you will be really, really angry. Yeah. I think that was me. the sensory experience too. And it you, is. And it's, it helps you, I think, establish a sense of place in a story uh, when you can think about the food. It's so particular sometimes to a 
a region, you know, Absolutely. a place. Well, and I, sure. I actually was just trying to figure out I'm having characters go out to dinner in a place where pretty much everything is possible. So now I have to kind of choose where am I going to have them eat? This will probably take me at least two weeks to figure out where I'm putting my characters. Oh, my God. Can you meet. please describe it in detail and send I, it to me? I will. I'm sure. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> But anyway, I want to read that. And especially if it's like historical food, because things have changed so much from the idea of the idea of when did we first get things like cookbooks and who was eating what back when my, my husband years ago gave me a Game of Thrones cookbook and I'm like, I'm not going to cook any of this, but it was still really cool. To look at. I'm not actually also like vegetables. we have to think about like when vegetables were kind of. Well, yeah. Well, not invented. Nobody invented vegetables. Generally. No, I'm not saying invented. I didn't say <laughs> that. But... Yeah, but that's the kind. Of, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that will send. Like you're talking about spending a couple weeks on something mm -hmm. that will send a historical down the rabbit hole. Down a rabbit down hole. Down the rabbit hole can of last forever. Who you know? wanted and, uh, us to eat leaves first? Well, but yeah. the idea of certain things, like right now, we live in a. At least in those of us who live in the United States, can get pretty much anything year round if you go to the right Whole Foods. And back in, you know, 200 years ago, everything, if it wasn't local and grown there, you weren't getting it. You weren't going to have it freeze dried and sent right. over. You just didn't happen. So cuisine was way more local. We, we are really, I mean, I know where I live. I'm so lucky to have pretty much anything I want. I can well, get. Well, you live in there. Southern California. I live in Southern <laughs> California. And when I visited my sister who flew in for the week, she was, she doesn't live here anymore. We were up and I remember driving by. I'm like, oh, little Ethiopia. I remember eating at a restaurant there that we can really just get cultures all over and that didn't that wasn't the case 200 years ago and for no, the you know, you're yeah. getting pecorino and dried figs <laughs> yep exactly and here's the exactly. thing i live currently in rural new hampshire now you and... don't live in civilization anymore i'm really sorry I don't, and that's this. but like it's all fine it's but as a vegetarian as somebody who has like dietary issues i want to live through your food you need to live here because <laughs> i was like a screaming to poor laura um before we end this do you have everybody here a current favorite painting a current favorite painting hmm. mine changes all the time so that's why i'm like hmm, maybe it's different yes no i don't think i have a current favorite painting like i said i'm i'm sort of deep into Botticelli at the moment, just because of my research for the uh, book that I'm working on. But um, no, I, I sort of am, am, I love a little bit of everything. I mean, when I was teaching art history, um, I had colleagues who really only wanted to teach their little narrow, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. area of art history. But I loved teaching the art history survey because it's everything. Oh, I love the cave paintings and I love the contemporary art and, and I love seeing the interesting connections between different eras and places. So I really, there's something to appreciate, I think, in, uh, in every culture and every era of art history. I love it. But if you had to have a painting in your bathroom, what would it be? <laughs> I love it. Oh man, I a love that. In my it's just like painting yeah, well, like what, like you buy in a bathroom. So that seems like it it should be it could be something to consider. <laughs> but I don't so know. So I will say my it. painting in my bathroom and it's been the same thing since I think I was 19. It was the Lady of Shalott. Oh, okay. And she's just and I bought like a little print of that. I think that's like the same one I had in my dorm room. <laughs> I know. And I mean, she's been, she's lived in yeah. every bathroom I've been in. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good paint bathroom painting. So it's I like, she's, she is. It's like soothing. Look, everything in my house is either finger paint or crayon because children. But <laughs> All I of that's say, good. I will say one of, one of my children, my middle child is an exceptionally skilled little artist and I fully expect her to be in museums eventually. She wants to teach art when she's older. Um, right now, I don't think she wants to teach anybody anything. She just wants a little brother to stop oh. bugging her. But she is amazing, and she can both do very, very accurate-looking re recreations of something else. I've got a picture of her, like, holding up her uh, the, the frog from the leapfrog. She's done all of them, but then she does her own creations, too. So 
you know, I will That's live great. vicariously through yeah, her. You should, uh, you should decorate awesome. your house with that. Sounds every great. Everything <laughs> in our walls, like I'm, I'm in the bedroom now. This is a thing behind me, but I don't have much in here other than something. My youngest child is obsessed with the back rooms and he did something of the back rooms. That's all I see now is yellow doors and yellow <laughs> wallpaper. And his favorite book is the yellow wallpaper. And no, he does not understand what that means. <laughs> I was like, what? He doesn't, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what that the yellow pop wallpaper means. He just thinks it's the back rooms where the bacteria monster comes. That's not oh, your original. Okay. No, it's not. No. All right. So we didn't get Laura to tell her, tell us our, her favorite painting. She just. But, but I thought we were going to see a European cover, maybe. Is oh, that let's do it. Yeah, well, there's there's a okay. new cover so, for a book. That's a new cover for a new for cover. Movies. So, um, the Stolen Lady. This is the U.S. Canada mm -hmm. cover, mm -hmm. but this is but... the big reveal of the new international yeah. cover. Of Ooh. The Stolen Lady. So first, first time ever, I'm revealing it here. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> beautiful. Is, um, this is the English language cover for That's everywhere correct. outside of USA and Canada. So USA and Canada, rest of the world in English. And then it's in translation with different covers all together, which I think is fascinating. I love the different love international it. cover covers are really well, cool. Well, sometimes so. I see people's covers and I go, well, I can't read that language, but can I buy it anyway? <laughs> I just don't <laughs> I know, like, I, I know, want to own really, that. They're so interesting, aren't they? Polish cover is amazing. Do you speak this Polish? This is my... Book cover of my new book that's coming out oh. that it's not uh i don't have a print copy is that yet, august so that we're getting that august on? first the last masterpiece oh, so you're um, gonna have to come back you know mm -hmm. that right yeah you're i definitely already will. committing i definitely will it's world war ii italy surprise <laughs> but it's it's not a dual timeline but it is two what? very different I won't. characters so uh two you, different you were right to wear the jackets lines. today jen it wouldn't be appropriate next time <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I love anything Italy. You know that. Well, the, yeah, the Leonardo <sighs> da Vinci jacket was a good call, though. I love it. Thanks. Sorry, I did like a really ugly thing with my face just then. People who are only listening to the audio, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, there's no captions for the things you do with your face. I, I know, it. where it's like, uh, Jennifer and Allison just did something weird. <laughs> the words rictus and grimace would probably and have then like seconds of like we don't know in, what that inappropriate is. yeah no one no one needs that <laughs> but laura thank you for being here i don't know if we were <laughs> super cool oh We've gosh never been no this is that. this is huh. really fun i really appreciate your having me and thank just you like, for reading the book well i think oh my god we love Allison it so much read it and i Jennifer, just i you said yeah. you you listened, I listened to, to it, right? it to the that's audio book well that's so. why I, I thought i was i was worried i wasn't going to get done in time because i didn't realize you had the acknowledgments there so i would see how many pages i was and then i'm like <laughs> this feels like i'm getting oh that was the end okay these are i kept telling you so like, i haven't finished you're, reading very, you're like you're there you're yeah. there well because i had i had some guesses early on i'm like jen if i don't finish it can you tell me if so and so is actually so and so and she's like <laughs> i did do some spoiling you did okay. but i was actually pretty close i was like I you were closer than i thought but you were closer i think than i was uh, all right well, just so you. just so you know, if you enjoyed the Stolen Lady, one of the characters from the Stolen Lady reappears wow. in the last masterpiece. Which so character? I, I won't say who it is. No. Um, I will. I'm going to ask after. After we I'm go, gonna, okay, know, I'm like, it's I'm someone ask who many readers wanted to. I hear there's from somebody again. I want to know about more. <laughs> so, As like I just like on the podcast, like is right. it Anywho, everybody, bye bye. <laughs> We've got to talk to her privately. Wrap the show, Jen. We're running out of. We're we are done. Time. We are right, done. Thank um, you very much. Laura, no, don't leave. Laura, don't like leave. Uh, stay tuned next week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again. Next we week. have been on hiatus. Next we week are, is we have Con Wong, the Circus Infinite. We will be back next week, so it is not like we're just gone for a while. We're not and gone forever. We I was on vacation. I just had sick children mostly, and eh, they're fine. But stay tuned. And Laura, do not leave. I have don't one leave. major question for we you. Okay, <laughs> I'm here. Bye.